بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Thank you again for being here. We are here for purification of the heart. This is going to be a six-week class, inshallah. Um, and uh, as I had mentioned, uh, uh, we are here, inshallah, to, to study this incredible text that really uh, is a great service that our Sheikh, uh, local scholar Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, has done for us by providing us this translation. Um, and it's considered, you know, by many of our great scholars, one of the classical, uh, you know, it's a great work, but Imam al-Ghazali specifically considered the study of this science to be an obligation. So it's really great that all of you are here and you're taking it seriously as we all should. It's something uh, that every, I think even children should, should study this or, you know, at, at age appropriate levels, but the younger the better because it's about really cultivating the, you know, yourself and becoming the best version of yourself. And you can't do that if you don't know what problems you have, right? It's, it's like, this is what it is. It's unearthing. It's, it's bringing all of that out. Like, you know, the, 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 we're, and we're all afflicted, right? We all have uh, diseases of the heart, which we're going to get into, inshallah, in a moment. But I wanted to start off before we dive into it about intention, because it really, um, we have to be intentional when we're doing something like this, that every day that we come here, and even when we leave and we're going back to our daily you know, lives, that we take the subject matter seriously and we really contemplate the meetings and the discussions that we're having here. And we read the text, we do the assignments, uh, and it won't be, I won't overload you. I'm not, you know, it's, we have time and there's 25 diseases, so you're not gonna do that much, but I want you know, to, you, to know that you're coming in here having read the material, having really participated, and you're taking in this class really with the same intention that we all, as I said, should have, which is we want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? That's the objective. And the way to do that is to, is to you know, to, to work on ourselves and to, uh, and to be as close to the prophetic example as possible. And you can't do that if you don't you know, look at where your uh, weaknesses and, and faults are and how to correct those things. So that's really the objective of this class is to, with that intention, we want to draw closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that said, um, I wanted to, you know, keep things real because, you know, as I said, I'm up here teaching, but I don't want there to be any impression that I have in any way mastered this science. I'm not a master. I've not, you know, I've, I've alhamdulillah, I was blessed to be, a part of it when Sheikh Hamza first uh, taught this and, and of course have studied it over the years, but I'm a student just like all of you are. And uh, I say that sincerely because I want this to be a discussion-based class where we're talking, we're sharing ideas, we're asking questions. So it's not just that I'm sitting here giving you information, you take it and you leave, but it's actually a conversation. So that was part of the description of the class. And I hope that's clear for everybody that we are here to dialogue. And we're kind of like doing it almost like in a book club format, you know, where you read a text together, okay? So that's how I want the class to flow. So I invite questions. I invite, uh, like, oh, I have something to share, uh, contributions. If you feel like something is relevant that you want to uh, mention, please, like, just feel open to do that. There's no formality here, okay? Inshallah. So um, my background, just to kind of, again, for those who don't know uh, me, I am a Bay Area native. I, I was raised here. I was not born here. I was born in Afghanistan, but came here like many refugee families did uh, to the U.S. And then we came to California around middle school. So I, I most of my uh, clear memories, clearest memories are here in California growing up. Um, and alhamdulillah, you know, like many people, I was raised in a conservatively cultural uh, or a, a culturally conservative family. So we had you know, rules that were cultural, they weren't necessarily defined to us um, as being religious rules. Uh, so I, I grew up, you know, not doing certain things and knowing, you know, clearly what was wrong and what was right. But I didn't have a strong Muslim identity. Um, growing up, I had a very strong cultural identity. So it wasn't until actually high school where I, um, my first experience ever hearing uh, a, a native you know, Muslim, he was a convert, but he was, you know, here American Muslim speakers speak about Islam. And he actually came to my high school and he did a presentation on the autobiography of Malcolm X. 
Um, and so, <laughs> yes, I was, I feel like I had a, a, a conversion experience, like so many converts do, I really did. I was watching this incredible, and he's local, you know, Imam uh, Abdul Malik Ali, right? We all know him, Amir Abdul Malik. He, when he came and he spoke about um, Malcolm X, it was the first time I ever, first of all, heard of his story. Um, but also just to see the passion and pride and conviction of a Muslim who was so proud of his faith was unique for me because I had never ever seen that before. I was around a lot of, as I said, people from my own culture and family and background, uh, but to actually see an American Muslim have such a strong American Muslim identity uh, was really profound for me and impacted me. And then he encouraged you know, us to read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And the movie, I think, had already come out or it was coming out. It was around that time. I think it was 1992, around that time. So I, um, I went to the library, like, you know, that day. And I actually checked out the book and I read it and I fell in love. I dove into that book and I was sold. I was like, this is one of the greatest stories ever. And then, of course, watching the movie only solidified how amazing, uh, you know, uh, uh, Malcolm X was and, and just really made me feel connected to him. And so that kind of was what I call the first uh, flip, you know, of my like spiritual awakening, right? I had this incredible awakening of, of who am I, you know, my identity as a Muslim. And then later in college, I had, you know, other experiences, which I've, I've spoken about. Some of you may have heard uh, that story about just, you know, being put in a situation where I had to confront uh, a speaker who came to the campus um, and spoke, you know, really um, uh, horribly about Islam and about the Prophet I said, and I was in a sort of confrontational situation with that speaker. Um, but that also was my second sort of awakening. So I had these experiences where I was being, you know, just drawn to the faith, um, and it took time, and that's, you know, I think many people share that experience. It doesn't always happen overnight. For some people, it does. Some people have tragedy, calamity, and suddenly they start, you know, questioning life and have an existential crisis. Uh, for other people, it can be gradual. And so for me, it was gradual. The loss of my grandfather was another really big experience. Seeing a dead person for the first time in your life as a teenager can definitely wake you up and start making you ask a lot of questions. So I had those experiences. Um, and alhamdulillah, and I'm, you know, it wasn't until uh, later on in college that I think it really, where I really started um, <clears throat> waking, having a full awakening, I guess you could say. I had small little moments of awakenings, but it wasn't until I was, <clears throat> I think it was of the year 1996 or so, I was practicing at that time. I was wearing hijab. I was, you know, had a, had a strong Muslim identity, but I wasn't really um, working on the internal at all, like, there was no, it was just all outward. It was very much about prayer and looking Muslim and talking tough and just, it, I don't know, it was just a different mindset um, that I had at that time. And it's because that's what was, you know, what was common. A lot of the people around me and the MSAs and the organizations that I was a part of, that's kind of what it was, right? There wasn't much emphasis on the spiritual or the inner dimensions and working on the inner. So I ended up, um, you know, finding kind of just stumbling upon uh, and it's an interesting experience. I'll share it with you guys. But I, <clears throat> I went to a friend's house. We used to get together in, at UC Berkeley. Um, it was like a bunch of sisters that we knew, uh, and we would have halakas at one of the sisters' homes. Um, and so it was common for me to kind of drop by. We just, you know, check, hang out. So I drove up uh, with uh, with another friend in the car, and we were going to hang out with some friends. And I noticed that some of the sisters were actually leaving and they were by their car and I was like, where are you guys going? And they're like, oh, there's this new class that's starting and uh, we're gonna go check it out. So I was like, oh, who, who's the class by? And they're like, oh, this teacher uh, named Hamza Youssef. <laughs> and so at that time I had only heard about him in uh, other circles and the comments weren't very nice, let's just say that. And, but my mind was like, oh really? Like I was curious and I was, you know, I kind of went with an agenda in a way. I'm, I, it's, it's not good, you know, I'm not proud of that, you know, now, but at that moment, I felt like I needed to go and basically hear what, you know, this Hamza Yusuf was saying and maybe potentially even confront him. I kind of had that personality type. So I was like, oh, you're going to that class? I'm going to follow you. So I ended up driving uh, from Berkeley all the way to Hayward after my, you know, behind my friend's car and 
I show up to the class, and I, I'm not, I can't remember if he was doing purification of the heart or if he was doing Sira. I, it was one of the two. I think it was, it might have been Sira, but he was teaching a class at that time, and I walked in with full, like, you know, intention to, like, you know, I don't know, just confront him somehow because I had heard things about him that were not true, but still. So anyway, I sit in the class, and subhanAllah, my first experience again, or second experience, I should say, hearing a Native American Muslim convert speak about Islam, but he was completely in the most real, authentic, you know, vulnerable state that I had ever seen a man or a person in, and he began to weep, you know, in, in his transmission. He was talking about the Prophet ﷺ, and he just couldn't contain himself, so he was crying, and I was like, oh my God, I've never seen a man do that before ever, right? Most of the men in our lives, and especially from my cultural background, are very stoic. They do not cry. It's like you don't see, you know, uh, your fathers, your uncles, your anybody do that. And here's this man who's so moved by, <clears throat> you know, the story of the Prophet ﷺ, which of course is so compelling in so many ways, that he just let his guard down and it was all heart. And it was an absolute uh, transference, you know, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his name is Muqallib al qulub right? The one who flips the hearts. <clears throat> I had that experience in that moment of sitting in front of this teacher, my heart completely flipped. I went there with this agenda to confront him and I thought I was going to catch him and stuff and I just was like, subhanAllah, what, you know, he's saying and what he's doing, there's, there's truth, there's haq to this. I want to know more. And so I ended up like coming every weekend he was doing classes and we were very blessed and honored to sit and learn from him and it was more than just Sira but this was one of the classes so that was for me the final awakening because I had really uh, you know just learned to appreciate the emphasis on working more on the internal because everything at that point for me was about the external and here I was learning that no you, the, you know, if you want to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't worry about the form, don't worry about how you look and how you appear and what people think of you. Don't worry about reputation and, you know, validation and getting all of that. No, work on yourself and make this your lifelong process that every single day you're cultivating, you know, yourself and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're doing that internal work. And that's, you know, I credit him. So that's why I'm here today because uh, Alhamdulillah, I've been blessed to, you know, to, to study and, and to learn from him as most of us in this community have been. And so, you know, with his permission, I am here to teach this class because I want to share uh, with all of you the, the great blessings that I have found uh, from learning this, you know, science and studying the science. And I think just doing it together, it's so necessary. We're living in a time where there's a lot of, um, you know, confusion. People are really lost about what to do and who to follow and who to listen to. And, you know, the messages outside are all about external, right? I mean, we're living in a fishbowl world now. Everybody's looking in on each other and we're all worried about how we appear and we're all, you know, it's all about image. It's so much emphasis on image. So I feel like we're, we actually, this is n very necessary, you know, to, to, to work on this. And that's why <coughs> it's, a, it's a great honor again to be here. Um, so, any questions so far about that? Huh? Yes. Sure. The books. Oh, there was a box of books here. There might be. Oh, there they placed them outside. So yeah, please make sure you have your books because we're going to look at parts of it today. But just to, for those of you who walked in late, just to kind of recap, today's an introduction class. So I was just introducing myself to all of you and why I'm here and my background. Um, and so, with that said, I did <clears throat> want to um, share a few things here about the, you know, the sort of, I guess, the, the outline of the, for the rest of the course. So, we have, there's 25 diseases uh, that are going to be covered in this book. And so, for today, we're going to do the biography of Imam al-Mawlud. We'll talk about him, who he was, do really more of an introduction on the, the science as an you know, overall like objectives. Um, and then we'll dive into the reading. We'll have a reading assignment after today. And next week we'll start officially going over the diseases, okay? So just I just want to make that clear. So 
Now, as far as before we get into the uh, biography of Imam al Maulud, I just wanted to again reiterate what I had said earlier. Assalamu alaikum. That um, this, you know, we have what we called uh, the the faraid, you know, the fard uh, in in our tradition, which are the obligatory things that we should all know. There are fard ain and fard kifaya. Fard ain are things that every individual should know, right? Fard kifaya are the collective responsibilities of like the communal responsibilities. So the fard ain are, you know, knowing your fiqh of uh, tahara, cleanliness, purification, prayer, um, knowing how to read the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the proper way. And then Imam al-Ghazali, who is again one of our great scholars, uh, greatest, one of the greatest scholars of our, of our uh, tradition, he considered, he's one of the ones who considered that this is a study that's also uh, fardain, that everybody should make it, uh, or it's obligatory on every Muslim to learn the science. So, you know, we, we should take this seriously. It's not just like, oh, we're electively just here to study this interesting thing, but rather I'm actually doing something that I might be asked about, you know, on the Day of Judgment, and so I'm Inshallah, with that seriousness, uh, I'm here. And, and, and that's the intention with which we should be here, inshallah. So I wanted to uh, start off by outlining, or first asking, how many, in, in the Quran and in the Hadith, the heart is mentioned several times, but in, a diff in different definitions, right? In different contexts. Does anybody know how many different types of hearts are identified? Uh, or even have an idea of some of the types of hearts that are identified that you can remember from like learning or like verses of the Quran? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is it? Afida. I'm not sure familiar with that. I think what, what I'm talking about is types of hearts, right? Like what? Like a, for example, a, a darkened heart, right? Qalbin Salim. Very good, right? Good. So there's different hearts that are described to us in the Hadith and the Quran. So I'm going to give you, and if can I ask someone to volunteer for me to write these on the board? It'll be really helpful if someone can do that, who has nice handwriting, because I'm. it's just English words. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, it's English only, not Arabic, don't worry. Um, but I'm going to just, I should have done that. I apologize before the class. I uh, forgot to do that. Um, but there are eight different types of hearts, okay? So we have the first one is the dead heart, okay? The second is the darkened heart. Okay. And then the third is the hardened heart. So a heart that's been hardened, darkened. Oh, sorry, the second one was darkened, apologize. Darkened, hardened, dark yeah, no, there's no sick yet. So dark, hardened, blackened, <clears throat> sealed, sealed, locked, yeah, these are all separate, uh, locked, blind, and then sound, okay? Blind, yeah, just blind, and then sound. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so those are the th eight different uh, types of hearts that we have been uh, introduced to through uh, either ayat of the Quran or hadith. Okay, and we're going to talk about each one of these. So the first one, the dead heart. How do you identify what a dead heart is? In chapter or 50, uh, verse 37, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Verily in this is a message for any that has a heart or who gives ear and earnestly witnesses the truth. From this verse, we can, uh, you know, deduce that obviously we all have a heart. We're living. We're not talking about the physical heart. We're talking about the spiritual heart. And so a person who, um, who has a heart, if they are, uh, you know, uh, if they're, if they're, uh, you know, as, as the verse says, for any that has a heart, if, if they give ear, they will witness the truth. So the opposite of that is that their heart is either, you know, is dead or that they're, um, you know, that it's non-existent, right? That there's just no spiritual, uh, you know, desire or, 
or or any uh, and you know uh, want to to uh, to know Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. And then this is very common. There's a lot of people who don't have any desire for God, and they'll they'll say that that religion is important, God isn't important, the billah, and this is how they we, we see it everywhere now. So this idea that a person can be physically awake and walking amongst us, but ha there there's some death right, happening, this is how uh, we ascertain that from this verse that there are people amongst us that are like that. They have dead hearts, right? <clears throat> and then this can also, you know, people, sometimes, you know, you can talk, you can attend a talk or there's Quran being recited, but some people are just not affected and you'll see it. You'll see really moving experiences, but people are just not, they, there's nothing happening to their hearts that would also be a sign of someone whose heart is deadened, right? Because the Qur'an should, you know, awake something in you, right? Or if you're standing in front of the Kaaba, for example, or seeing something really amazing, we should have a visceral, physical response to that. But if you're just like nothing, and they're in, you know, and sometimes it's it's not that it's, you know, um, there's, it's deadened to the point where it can't be revived. So don't lose hope. Because there are people who will feel like, well, I'm just at a place where life is really hard right now. And I'm, yeah, emotionally stunted and I don't really respond to things. I've, I've you know, met with people who say that, that they just, in their prayers, they don't feel anything. Or when they're, you know, listening to Quran or just don't, they have no desire to do certain things. And that's indicative of, yes, there's a spiritual, you know, disconnect there that has to be addressed. So, but there, all hope is not lost. Don't worry. It's just a matter of how do you revive that type of a heart. But the idea that a heart can fall to that level of just almost, you know, no act, you know, there's no response is, is, um, is a sign again that, that is uh, happening all around us and it's very common. But we have to know the signs of it, that that's one of them. This is a, you know, a symptom of it. Um, a darkened heart. Okay, so what's a darkened heart? A heart that was initially dead can come alive, again, with the reminders, with Quran, with good company. All of these things can happen, right? But if someone is plunged in darkness and misguidance and disbelief, uh, and they continue uh, to, you know, to to surround themselves like that after being, you know, uh, brought into the light. This is darkened heart, right? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has awakened you, or you had guidance, but now you are by your own uh, choices, by your own, mis you know, you're, you're falling back into bad behavior or things you shouldn't be doing. This is a dark. This is a heart that's darkened now because you had. The light you had you know guidance and then you chose to turn and so now your heart is being darkened okay. <clears throat> a hardened heart so a heart that is completely devoid of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala becomes hardened so if you're not you know doing things actively to remember Allah over time, this is the consequence, that your spiritual heart will become hardened. So it's almost like all of these things lead to, to another. If you continue to have a hardened heart, eventually you're going to have a dead heart, right? That's just the, the natural course because you are uh, not doing anything to actively keep that spiritual heart awake. And that's what dhikr of Allah is, prayers, you know, doing all of the stuff that we should be doing on a daily basis. If you think of, you know, um, your... Just the the five prayers alone are for us to check in and to you know wait you know, to kind of wake up from the delusion of the dunya because we can get caught up in all this you know the, the, the stuff that we're doing. So we go to pray and we're we're to really to remind us of our purpose. But even in addition to that, we have so many other things that we should be doing actively, right? All the daily duas, for example. How many of us do the daily duas that we should be doing? When you wake up in the morning, right? The first things you should say as soon as your eyes open, is a da'a. How many of us do that, right? All of that is to constantly keep us in connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the heart needs that. The heart needs this, you know, just continuous, you know, feeding and nurturing of remembrance. And if we don't do that, the consequence is that it becomes hardened. And so many of us now, if you really think about it, even in our prayers, we're not present, right? 
it's many times, and I've heard from people like, you know, you stand in prayer and you don't even know how many rakat you've done. You don't remember the surahs you recited, right? But you were thinking about what you have to do next, what you did yesterday. So because we're so distracted now, we have so many th distractions that even in a time where we should be focused and we should have that ability to connect, we can't. So this is a sign of a hardening of the heart, right? Um, and it's because we're not doing enough remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so you want to look at your whole day and say, where are the times where I'm actually really sitting with myself and thinking about um, Allah and, you know, letting just, you know, whether it's, and you can do that through different ways. You can just do it, you know, uh, like driving, for example, in your car or washing the dishes. You know, you could do it anywhere. Remembrance of Allah that doesn't have to be done just on a prayer mat, you know, or with the Quran in front of you. You can do it at all times of the day, but how often do we do that versus turn on the music, right? Um, or a podcast about something. And not to say that those things aren't beneficial, but if you're not making time for the remembrance of Allah actively, but yet you have time to do all these other things, do you see that is going to contribute to the hardening of the heart? Your heart will gradually not be as affected, you know, by, by the things that it should be affected by. The connection you feel will start to, you know, sort of like, you know, like on the phone when you, you're talking to someone and the connection starts to go down and you're like, hello, hello, hello. That's kind of have to, how you have to think about your spiritual connection with Allah. If you're not attentive to it regularly, every day, this isn't, you know, it's not a seasonal thing where we become seasonally inspired, you know, around Ramadan or right before Ramadan, that's not Islam. Islam is every single day, committed, concerted effort, active engagement, and you deliberately make time and schedule in things that are going to, uh, you know, get you closer to your Lord. And the five prayers are not enough. They are, they are essential and they are absolutely the most important but they're not enough to do that in a time and day and age where we are now, where we're so incredibly, like I said, bombarded and distracted easily. We can't rely on just thinking, I'm gonna you know, commit to my five prayers and, and that's gonna be good enough. It's, we need more, we need active engagement. <clears throat> so, I'm sorry, did I have a question? You had a question? Oh, sure. Of course. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's directly against uh, one of the clear hadith of the, of the Prophet who said, give salam to those you know and you don't know, right? So, you know, there's clearly, uh, and that's a social ill that we have. A lot of people have become so socially just, you know, unaware of themselves, you know, where they only, you know, and, and social anxiety is real. It's a problem of our society where people really feel awkward talking to people they don't know or approaching people they don't know. Whereas in Islam, we're literally, we're supposed to look at each other all as a family, like one ummah, one body. So you, you know, could you do that to your family members where you walk into the home and you only talk to one person or you only, but for some reason there's this awkwardness that we've, I think, imposed. It's not from our tradition for sure. It's a lot of it's cultural, a lot of it's social, a lot of it's individual, right? People have their own individual temperaments and they're, you know, afraid to maybe put themselves out there. Vulnerability is not easy for people. So that, you know, affects their, um, their connection with other people, which absolutely will affect your heart. You know, if you're not, uh, you know, part of our deen is to social, you know, um, in, or emotional intelligence, part of that is, you know, the ability, social skills, right? And emotional intelligence is really Islam. If you look at all of the definitions of emotional intelligence, it is Islam. And it's uh, embodying all of the prophetic qualities. And the Prophet ﷺ was masterful at so many things, but one of his great qualities was being able to connect with every single person, you know, no matter where they were at, no matter what their background was, it didn't matter. He was able to really engage people and make them feel seen and heard. And this is what we should, as Muslims, put into practice. We should work on our social skills so that we make people feel welcome. And that's why smiling is a huge part of that. 
right? Smiling, saying salams, being people that spread, you know, afshal salam abaynakum. This is all a hadith, you know, be people who spread peace. Be people who are easy and, and, and people are drawn to, to you because you are approachable, right? Uh, but we've unfortunately gone back in many ways with that. And so it absolutely is connected to that. So thank you for bringing that up. <clears throat> Um, the blackened heart, and this is, you know, Ibn Masud said that the, the slave continues to lie and a black spot grows on the heart until all the heart becomes completely black. And this is, and this is, you know, one of the great hadith that we should visualize. I like to visualize things because it, you know, it helps you to sort of just imagine what's happening every time you do something, every time you make riba, every time you lie, every time you eat from the haram or take rislets from the haram, or you do anything that is haram, you want to actually imagine that that's what's happening, that you have this beautiful heart, it's glowing, it's full of light, right? It's just pure, but every, it's like a dot, you know, like a Sharpie marker, you just colored into it, and it's permanent right, uh, until you do the necessary steps to remove that. But it's on, it's on your heart. And so uh, this is, you know, one of the tragedies, again, is that we, sins have become so common now and people take them lightly. They don't really look at them as having an effect because it's like, you know, God's the most forgiving. It's okay. My heart is good. I'm a good person. And so you kind of start taking sins, like, lightly or you think that, um, you know, you can, and I know, you know, I've heard people say, like, when I get older, you know, I'll do this act, right? <laughs> like, all my youth is going to be spent doing whatever I want to do, sowing my wild oats, you know. Uh, but when I, at this time in my life, I'll start taking things more seriously after I do Hajj, you know. And those are not guarantees. Nobody has any guarantee if we're going to, you know, live to see tomorrow, let alone the future. So uh, having that kind, and this is actually one of the diseases of the heart, which we'll get to, to have this, you know, uh, wrong idea about your life. Uh, but, you know, this, uh, con the, just to, to imagine every time you're sinning, that's what you're doing. You're literally darkening this wonderful th this thing that you've been given that connects you to your Lord. You're hindering its growth. You're stunting it. And it's, you know, um, it's, uh, it's causing its, its death because it's like suffocating it, right? It's every sin that you do, it's preventing the light from growing. It's preventing you from having that connection with Allah. So you are spiritually, uh, you know, suffocating and stunting your own growth when you sin. And so, again, visualize those things. I think it's important to do that. So the sealed heart is the next one. And this is uh, in Surah Ar-Rum, chapter 30, verse 59. Thus Allah does stamp the hearts of those who understand not. So a sealed heart is one that... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sealed uh, belonging to those who transgress or who completely deny the truth. So may Allah protect us from that. But these are, you know, good just definitions to know because when you're reading these verses or, you know, reading certain hadith, you want to, you know, again, f see what is, uh, you know, what is... Uh, the, what's ideal and what we should seek protection from and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from ever being amongst those who have any of these negative hearts, right? We don't want any of these so far, right? Uh, the locked heart, and this is in chapter 47, 24, do they not then earnestly seek to understand the Qur'an or are their hearts locked? Okay, so this uh, person whose heart is locked is averse to uh, reading, reflecting, understanding, seeking knowledge, or reflecting upon the Qur'an. And there are people who are like that. They just don't have a relationship with the Book of Allah. And so it's like, you know, there's there's something, again, a lock on their heart from actually uh, being open to um, to his word, his message. And it's um, oftentimes it's imposed. It's hard for people to, especially if they're immersed in sin, to want to engage in any type of, you know, act, you know, uh, you know, religious act, right? It's hard. It's like to imagine like, oh, you know, I just drank alcohol last night or I went to this, you know, club last night and now, you know, uh, how can you? So people, what they do, and this is from Shaitan, it's like a, you know, a choice you make, which is if, uh, so long as I'm living this lifestyle that's, you know, convenient, it's fun, it's exciting, I cannot do these things, right? Um, and that's, uh, it's normal. I think most people are like that. 
But it's, again, it's self-imposed if you do that, right? Because um, you're the one who chooses to put that lock on your heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not preventing you, especially Muslims. And we see Muslims doing this nowadays. There's many Muslims who drink alcohol openly. It's not a big deal anymore. And you see it at weddings. I mean, I've, been, I've seen wedding pictures where they have, um, you know, bottles of champagne on the, the table for the guests. And I just am like, subhanAllah, there was a time where, you know, you had a, a small group of people who were like by the garbage, you know, cans in the, you know, in the parking lot, like the big garbage bins. And you knew what they were doing. But they at least had some shame and they would hide and they would keep it away. But now it's out in the open because people have made a choice. They, they prefer a different lifestyle, right? They prefer the lifestyle of, you know, everybody around them and, and that's what they're going to do. So they're imposing on themselves because they have the truth guaranteed those same people have Qur'ans in their house guaranteed guaranteed many of those same people have memorized Qur'an they know verses they've you know they have all of it available to them so um, it's important to remember this is uh, the lock is not from Allah it's from oneself mm -hmm. so sealed is for those who are completely deny the truth like the transgressor or the disbeliever, like there's, you know, and that's why we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides and misguides, right? He, that's from him. There, there's no, you know, they, for, they, they've transgressed, they've chosen, so there's no openings for them, right? They turned. So, but the locked heart is you. You have, you know, the truth, you, ha you know the truth, uh, but you don't wish to, you know, engage or, or in any way have, uh, you know, implement the truth into your own life. You're just in denial. Yes? For this one, it was 40, chapter 4724. Mm -hmm. Yes? Sure. The sealed heart was chapter 30, verse 59. No, that's what, well, that's what free will is, right? We all have free will, and that's one of the things you have to remember. Guidance is, you know, we, we make the choice, right? When we have the ability to discern from right and wrong, that's the time where we make the choice whether or not we follow. When the truth is given to us, when the truth is presented to us, we can either choose to accept it and act on it, or we choose to delay it or not act on it, right? And so from that point forward, when we make those decisions, then the rest of it is, you know, the outcome of that decision, right? It's I, but it's all in our choice. So it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is selectively, you know, we have the ability to choose. And so what happens to us once we make the choice, though, yes, that is, you know, we reap, you know, I mean, those are the consequences of our actions, right? Or of our choices. But the initial choice, all of us are on the same, you know, uh, we're going to be judged according to the same, like that moment. When was that moment when, you, when the truth was presented to you and you, you know, you made the decision whether or not to oblige or to not, right? We'll all be asked about that. And then uh, obviously everything that happens after that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we did the locked heart, the blind heart. This is um, chapter 22, verse 46. It says, do they not travel through the land so that their hearts must, then, must thus learn wisdom and their, hear, their ears may thus learn to hear? Truly, it is not their eyes that are blind, but their hearts which are in their chests. So the blind heart is the one where, again, everything around you is obvious. It's there. The truth is visible. I mean, here, for example, we're in this beautiful... Uh, you know, community where you have access to knowledge. Uh, there's, you know, alhamdulillah, we're a very welcoming community. I've been a part of different communities. I've traveled, you know, and you feel, I feel like, uh, you know, alhamdulillah, we're very blessed, right? We, we have a community center that's active, it's thriving, accommodates the needs of everybody, really. If you look at the classes and offerings that we have here, I don't know of anybody that's not being taken care of. The elderly have classes, special needs classes, women's classes, youth. So we have an environment that's so welcoming and warm, but a lot of people 
choose, you know, to walk right past it or, or to just not even ever enter, you know, ever enter the space because they've uh, made up their minds. And I've met with people who are like, yeah, we don't go to the masjid. We just don't, you know. Um, they choose, again, not to see the good that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for them. And, and so that would be, a, again, a sign of someone with a blind heart. Like the truth or the, all the blessings Allah has given you, your health, your family, all of those things, where they come from, right? So if you have a heart that is able to recognize the good and the blessings that you've been given, then you want to be grateful to the source of those blessings, right? But if you're blind to all that or you're entitled and you just think it's just, you know, you're just deserving of certain things, then you're, it's going to prevent you from seeing the signs of Allah, from making those connections, from wanting to draw it closer to him. So there, there's like a, you know, there's a barrier there. There's a veil over your eyes. So there's people who are like that. They're just blind to the, to the ni'mah of Allah, to the blessings of guidance. May Allah again protect us from all of that. Now, all of these, you know, I know it's, they're, they're all negative and it's again we're just use we're identifying them because it's important to know the distinctions but really the 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 one that the last one here is the one that it, we all want right this is the heart that we all should be striving for right the qalbun salim as our brother mashallah mentioned right uh, and this is in uh, chapter 26 verse 88 verse 89 excuse me um <clears throat> so what is the qalbun salim right this is, you know, the, the heart that is free from uh, vice, from evil, right? There, it doesn't want evil for people, doesn't have those, you know, uh, just it's, it's so connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wanting so much to draw near him that it's free from all of those diseases where it would wish harm on anybody else, where it transgresses and sins and, and, you know, does anything that would displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this heart is sound. It's that light that we described in the beginning, right? The heart that's just full of light and removed from all those black spots. That's the qalbun salim. It's just intact. It's uh, vibrant. And it's, it knows, you know, its creator. And it has a connection with its creator, you know. So that's why, you know, <clears throat> khushu, having presence, uh, you know, being able to really, uh, again, feel the power of the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if you, if you cry when you're listening to the book of Allah, that's a great sign. It's a great sign that your heart has life and that there's, you know, that you're, you're, you feel this connection with your Lord. And there's, there's so many YouTube videos, subhanAllah, of people who aren't even Muslim, but their hearts are alive. You've seen them, right? They're non-Muslims who cry and weep at the Qur'an. Or even the adhan, because that's fitra. We all are, you know, we're all going back to the same one, right? And some hearts can be awakened, just even in a language they don't understand, but there's something about, you know, the power of the Book of Allah that reverberates to them, right? And so there's many people that that are like that, but they're not. They don't, they don't even have to be Muslim. So what what do we say about a Muslim? Who doesn't feel those things, right? It's that, that, that's what we covered, right? But the qalbun salim, it feels, uh, you know, that connection and, and it's sound. And as I said, it's free of uh, corruption, disease, um, and evil. And the way to attain that heart is active work and cleansing. Just like you cleanse a container, right? You're always cleansing containers. Why? Even, you know... Um, there's, for example, I'm, I'm always like, you know, I, I need to say the science of it, but I have a soap dish in my, you know, kitchen sink. I know many of us do. It, I, I'm always shocked. I'm like, why does this get dirty? Like, I don't understand why a soap dish gets, you know, grime and like it starts looking dirty. Because I'm like, it's full of soap on the inside and I'm always rinsing it on the outside. But subhanAllah still needs to be cleansed, right? So I'm, I find myself cleaning a soap dish, and I think it's, you know, ironic. But the heart is similar, even though it's, you know, it, it's not, you're, you're never going to get it to a place where you just need to stop cleaning it. You have to constantly clean it. 
and it's an active day-to-day -day -day exercise that we have to do. So that's why studying this is not just like a subject that you, you know, read from cover to cover and then it's like, okay, I'm good. No, you have to implement it and there's active, you know, exercises that you're, you know, we're going to get into inshallah as we study it. But that's why, you know, when you think of the Qalb salim you want to look at, again, this heart that is intact, but it's intact because the one who is, you know, the, the possessor of the heart is working uh, and r recognizes that it's, uh, you know, it's something that they, they have to commit to uh, every single day. And, you know, the Prophet is a perfect example of that. I mean, when you look at his... Uh, Sira, we know who he is. He knew who he was. He knew that he was where he was destined to be. He knows he's the beloved of Allah. He knows that Jannah is already written for him. But yet he still worked, you know, actively was engaged with his Lord, actively did things to keep that connection thriving and alive. Uh, so for anybody who thinks that, oh, I don't have to pray or I don't have to do this, you know, those are all just cancel those things out because nobody with any credibility says those things who's Muslim. A Muslim knows that it is a lifelong commitment to be a Muslim, and 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 that means active engagement with your, with your faith, and and being constantly working on yourself as a work in progress. Yes, right. And that's a very good point, and that's and uh, you know I think you you might have not been here in the beginning, but we did in sharing my own story. I did mention how you know getting caught up in in the outward form is a big problem, right? Because you're right, we shouldn't um, put too much emphasis on practice per se. It really is about the heart, and there are very good people, Muslim and non-Muslim, who uh, might not be all, you know, completely, you know, like they, they're, they haven't perfected or, or really gotten into um, some of the things that they should, in terms of their spiritual practice, they haven't gotten found that, you know, rhythm, I guess you could say, where they're doing things actively and consistently, but they still have goodness in them, and we can't deny that. People are good, you know, and that goodness comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and so we shouldn't discount uh, people based on, you know, what they do. But in terms of, uh, you know, our faith, the the point of all of this is to bring them together, to bring the outward and the inward into balance, right? So that you are uh, actively doing all of the things that you should be doing because you recognize that's the purpose of your creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you to worship him. So prayer isn't uh, optional. Prayer is mandatory on you because you realize, like, that's why I'm here. And all of the blessings that I've been given and all of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the benefits or the privileges of existence are, um, you know, are, 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 you know, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifts, but in order for me to, we can never repay him, but the least I can do is, you know, is to, is to worship him as he asks to be worshipped, and prayer is the first thing we're going to be asked about on the day of judgment. So you take your prayer seriously, but then at the same time, you also realize that, um, you know, you're, you're definitely not above people, and that you shouldn't, you know, see yourself as that, and that you're constantly, like I've been, you know, like we've been saying, you're a work in progress, and so you have that humility that makes you more focused on your own internal state than just, you know, looking at people and checking what they're doing and what they're not doing. That's not for any of us to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate judge. But I think the the point of, um, you know, again, <clears throat> our faith is to bring these two in, uh, in balance together. And so if there's a disconnect in either or the other, where you're not practicing enough, uh, you know, or you're doing so much that you're starting to, you know, look at other people and judge them. There's a, a problem with both. You know, we should just be very focused on ourselves and our own practice. But yes, yeah, serve uh, the creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala uh, with humility and with sincerity, uh, all as part of our acts of devotion to Him. Right? It all comes back full circle to us wanting to get closer to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right, so, but thank you for sharing. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> how do you how do you reconcile? Well, a lot of it does have to do with our upbringing, right? Our the environments that we were raised in, because you have people who were raised in in loving, nurturing homes, and they've been given models of people with really good character. You know, there's people who are not Muslim, but they've been raised in homes where they don't lie, they don't drink, they don't cheat. They're good people. They're taught to serve others. Um, and so this is very common. It's not that we are the only people that do good deeds, you know. Uh, there's virtues in all different faiths and backgrounds. So if you're raised in an environment where that's your life and uh, people around you, that's the kind of people that you've been, you know, uh, you know uh, enriched by, 
that's going to have an effect on you, and your character is going to be built by that. Conversely, you could be raised in a Muslim household that's toxic, that's dysfunctional. So you have a faith, you know, the home is, is you know, all centered around a faith, but then unfortunately the individuals in the home aren't complying with the faith and they're actually acting out of it. So it can cause, you know, problems for a person, right? In growing in that type of an environment. And that's where a lot of people's spiritual struggles do come from. It's like from experience. Well, like, you know, I, I believe Islam to be true, but then I have all these negative people or examples, you know, around me that are not, you know, you know, practicing Islam the way it should be. So it can cause them to have spiritual conflicts, right? Because it doesn't, you can't reconcile the two. If you're a believer, you should have a certain type of a character. So how do you, you know, say the shahada? How do you go and greet people in the masjid? And there's, you know, many people, unfortunately, who do that. They'll come into the masjid and they'll be so, you know, great with everybody else. But then in their homes, they're tyrannical. So this can, you know, obviously cause a lot of people's struggles. But I think ultimately it comes down to, yeah, the environment that a person was raised with. And that's why we see uh, goodness in, in all people, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, it's from him ultimately. But he, there's definitely virtue, virtuous people that are, are amongst us uh, that don't necessarily, um, you know, that it's not because of Islam that they have those virtues, but the, st the same uh, ideas are taught in other traditions as well. You know, Christianity, Judaism, Buddhism, all the great re major religions, we have very similar ideals in terms of morality, in terms of, you know, think, you know, high goals that people want and virtues. We have, you know, it's all similar. So, yeah. No way, no problem. Alhamdulillah. Okay, are there any questions so far? So let me just see the time check. Yes. Right. Yes. Actively sinning. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So, yes. Uh, did everybody get that? So, if you're, you know, in an environment where you are around negativity and toxicity, you're likely going to be affected by that. It's going, your heart is going to gradually be darkened, right? And that's why sohbah matters. That's why it matters who you spend your time with. Uh, if you spend time with people who uh, pull you away from the members of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will likely fall into their same patterns of behavior. The opposite is true. If you, you know, spend time with people who remind you of Allah, they're going to increase you. You're going to feel more connected with him. So it's very important to look at the people that you spend most of your time with. And then the uh, blackened heart is where you're actively doing something to, you know, uh, to take away that light source where you are sinning you're doing you're transgressing you're not uh fulfilling your, your obligations you're not praying you're not doing the obligations that you should be doing that is going to accumulate as you know kind of like a cancer around your heart you want to think of it that way a spiritual heart it's cancerous sins are cancerous right and what does cancer do if anybody from the medical background knows it it's there's cells that rapidly grow and they take over whatever they're growing on to the point that they destroy the healthy tissue and eventually cause it to die. Um, and so may Allah protect us from that, right? So those distinctions are important, but thank you for mentioning that. So now I just wanted to go over the biography of the author um, because, again, it's important to know who he is and, 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 uh, and why he put this beautiful text together for us. So this uh, biography is actually comprised by our very own Sheikh Rami here, uh, who, who's a spiritual counselor here. May Allah protect him. He's also the husband of Dr. Rania Awad. So please make the offer for him as well for contributing to this. But um, Imam al-Mawlud, Muhammad Mawlud, he was born in the country of Mauritania in the year 1260 Hijra, or 1844. <clears throat> he was born into one of the religious clans known as the Zawaya in Mauritania, which made scholarship their primary focus. They took every effort to pass on knowledge to every successive generation. So he was, alhamdulillah, born into the perfect environment, right, for this. 
He came from a long line of scholars who were also accomplished authors and religious judges, qadis, who ran traditional Islamic universities known as mahdaras. Okay. His father is Qadi Ahmed Fal, the son of Qadi Muhammad Fal, the son of Qadi Al Amin, the son of Qadi Al Mukhtar, the son of Qadi Al Fa Al Musa. Even though many of his grandfathers were Qadis or judges, Muhammad Mawlud chose not to take the position of a judge, preferring to spend uh, his time authoring books, and especially uh, with the focus uh, around spirituality, tasawwuf, and the Arabic language. So those were his specialties. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He's from a family known as the Yaqubiyin, who are descendants of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu his mother is Maryam bint Muhammad Mawlud ibn al-Nahi, and she was also um, very knowledgeable, and she is credited to be his first teacher. So for all the mothers in the room, take pride in that. You know, that alhamdulillah, he's one of many scholars who've, who've said the same. I believe Imam Shafi, many of our great scholars, that their mothers were their very first teachers. So um, alhamdulillah. He was, uh, oh, while he was still a child, he, memor he memorized the entire Qur'an at the hands of his mother. So his mother, again, alhamdulillah, um, was his first teacher, but also his first Qur'an teacher and produced a hafiz. So even if you're not his necessarily teaching your children, but you're still, you know, putting them uh, in environments where they're learning the book of Allah, inshallah, you have a part of that, you know, you'll get the reward of that, dropping them off to teachers or Sunday schools where your children are learning uh, for both mothers and fathers is, is a great thing to do. Um, so inshallah, may Allah uh, you know, reward everyone here who, who does that and increase and encourage us to do that, to, to have our children always connected to the Quran. But here's an example of a mother who did that for her son, right? He was a great scholar of his time and authored many works on what he saw as much needed um, relevant knowledge. In total, he authored 70 works, including books, poems, and commentaries. And he passed away in the year 1323 <clears throat> in uh, Mauritania. So this uh, book is written in the format of a poem, actually, in Arabic. Okay. So has anybody actually read parts of it or any part of it? You have? OK, alhamdulillah, good. Very good, alhamdulillah. Um, so yeah, it's written, I, with the Arabic text isn't in this, or my translation, I don't know if any of the new versions, are, is there Arabic in your version? No? Okay, so there's no Arabic at all in this, yeah. So my, because I know they reprinted it, but mine is a little older. But yeah, it's a, it's a poem. And so, subhanAllah, he, um, I mean, we can just go ahead and jump into the introduction on page 13. <clears throat> So I wanted to read from this part of this introduction page, inshallah. Does anybody want to read as well? Anybody like to read out loud? Have any? Yes, you'd like to read out loud? Please do, bismillah. So go ahead and read for us, starting from page 13. Go all the way until we have the word on the third paragraph, haya. And then we'll see if anybody else wants to jump in. Okay, bismillah. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. So my page 13 is the introduction to purification. Oh, that's page one? Oh, okay. Okay, sorry, subhanAllah. Okay, I should actually grab a new copy maybe. <laughs> so we're on the same page, literally. Okay, so where it says courtesy, um, the heart, I hope it's the same. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, anything changes? Oh, Jazakallah khairan, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. Jazakallah fikum. Perfect. Okay. Great. So yes, we'll we'll go all the way until the next page. Wow, ours is very different. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I need a new copy. Inshallah. Okay, please, Bismillah. There for a moment. Thank you. So we've learned quite a few different terms here, right? Uh, we should be very familiar. I think for the most part, we should all know what adab is, right? We all know adab is manners. Um, <clears throat> but this idea of shame, I think, is really important to talk about because. Um, as is mentioned in this last paragraph that was just read, we've, we come from a culture and a time now where people really um, look down on shame, and there's a reason for that. 
because you know shaming by a person to another person is one thing, right? But the actual concept of shame is is part of our fitra. It's it's a good thing to have an internal shame, where you yourself feel bad about the things that you've done. You feel remorse, you feel regret, and then you you you're you're uncomfortable because of that feeling, right? That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But sometimes they're conflated. And it's because, you know, in a society that doesn't have, um, you know, an appreciation, maybe you could say, for religious tradition the way it used to. Right now, as we mentioned earlier, people are so, uh, you know, repelled by anything that comes from organized religion that as soon as you even mention those words, they push it away. And any ideas that come from those you know, uh, things also they push away. So an idea of shame um, has become, they're shaming shame, <laughs> right? To the point where anytime you, you, you even talk about people feeling bad about certain things, then you're being, you know, like you're the one that's wrong. Like how could you shame them? But it's that's not right, right? We have, as Muslims, to appreciate that we have fitra, and that fitra is, is part of the fitra is, agitated when we sin, right? And that agitation can come out with a type of uh, internal disgust where you feel bleh by yourself. And if you've ever sinned, and you know, some, so I don't know if it's a hadith or how, but I've just heard it over the years that, you know, when, Ibl when you're sinning in the midst of the sin, Iblis is right there with you until you do it, right? Like he wants you to get to the point where you're doing whatever the sin is. But once the sin is over and done, he flees. Because his job is done, right? It's like, khalas, he got you to the point of doing what you, he wanted you to do. So that's why oftentimes after people do things they know they shouldn't do, what happens? Ugh. Don't you feel horrible, right? You feel so wrong. That is your own soul. Right? Your soul basically speaking to you and reminding you, like, you should have, you should have done that. <laughs> that's wrong. But that's internal shame. And that's not a bad thing. You know, it's, uh, I just, I wanted to mention that because I feel like we're getting this total opposing message constantly everywhere we look about any shame at all. But that's, you know, I agree that people shouldn't shame one another. That's not Islam. You have no right to shame another human being, even your own child. When they make mistakes, uh, you should correct and you should, you know, be the parent and be the objective person that can help them see where they went wrong. But you are not in a position to shame them, humiliate them, make them feel lesser than, uh, and, you know, send them into their bedrooms. Like, you know, don't do that. Or with your spouses or with anybody, your siblings or whoever's in your life, sometimes, you know, people can get really ugly with other people when they make mistakes or, or sin or act out. But it's very self-righteous, right? It, it's from your own nafs. It has nothing to do with them and wanting them to be, you know, better or it's just like you're offended and it's personal. And now you want to angrily shame them. That's not Islam and that's not anybody, nobody has a right to do that to another person, you know? And there's so many examples of, subhanAllah, the Prophet is showing us how we should actually, like for example, the woman who came to him having had just committed adultery, you know, she was feeling shame and she wanted to confess her sin. But the Prophet says, how did he react? He walked away from her. He, he was acting like he didn't even hear her because he didn't want to, you know, put her in that position and you know but she was very she pushed and pushed and because she wanted to be punished she committed adultery she slept you know i mean she acted outside of her marriage so she wanted to face her punishment in this world which is what head punishment is you know capital punishment is is real and and at that time he, he, he chose, but he didn't want to initially do it. So he just walked, he kept walking um, because he didn't want to do that. But here we have people who, when they, you know, confess something to their parents or their spouses or whatever, the response is just so negative and it makes them feel even worse about themselves. 
you know, and I work with youth, so I see this a lot. A lot of youth have, you know, a hard time opening up to their parents because the parents' response is to shame. And it's all about, how could you do this to me? And what will people say? And it's not even about your child and their akhirah and their heart and their connection with Allah. It's all you. And if you really pay attention to your words, a lot of the times it's totally about you. Because you can't handle them doing something that's going to compromise you. So that's where the anger comes from. And that's where the punishments come from. And some people take it to a whole different degree and physically assault and do really horrible things. But it's all nafs. Whereas, you know, if you truly cared about them, you would want to stop and, you know, counsel, like, see what's happening. Like, oh, my God, you're, you know, you're under spiritual attack. Shaitan has got you, and I need to help you out of that. So let me, you know, envelop you with love and compassion and understanding and try to bring you back, not to push you further away. So it's important to, again, know the distinction between a good, healthy internal shame and shaming that's negative and toxic and unacceptable. Because uh, I think we're conflating them as all being the same, and they're not. Okay, so we stopped at some anthropologists. Yes? Yes? Okay. No, it's, I'm so glad you brought this up. Because, you know, I don't know. The, I, I'm kind of curious to know um, who or wh what led you, led you to believe that modesty is defined by those specific terms. Because in, in some respects, yes. But have you, uh, for example, have you studied the four temperaments in Islam? Okay, so the four temperaments is a whole beautiful science that actually speaks to the colorful, you know, nature of human personality. And it definitely doesn't impose limitation on boys or girls or men or women that you have to be, you know, this timid, quiet person. No, it actually says there are four temperaments that people can have, and some of them are boisterous and, you know, very strong and fiery and active and... And, and, and others are, you know, softer and more introverted. But that's definitely not the golden standard, that last one. That in order for you to be, you know, a, a good Muslim, that you have to be necessarily quiet and timid and introverted and not have, you know what I mean? That's, that's not, I don't know if you've been so, told that, but that's certainly not true. Well, the where I live in, for example, is my Right. It is culture. It's absolutely culture. And that's why we have to push back. Like, those notions are not right. And if you feel that people are stepping out and they're, you know, isolating or targeting a certain demographic with a certain type of shame that's unfair, I would push back on that and say no. Because our girls and I, you know, I, if you, I don't know if you've ever sat in any of my sessions, but I work a lot with uh, about female empowerment and young girls. And so for me, that's something that we should definitely push back on. If you observe it and you feel like people are culturally imposing their views in a masjid space and actually, you know, taking away a girl's ability to be herself because of their own cultural views. That's not, no, the masjid is a place for everybody. And not to say that, you know, everybody should be walking around screaming and, you know, doing whatever. There's decorum, of course. There's, it's, this is a place of, it's a sanctified place and we have certain rules that, but it should be across the board is what I'm saying, right? All the rules should be for everybody. Right. And, it, and, it, and, if it's, and if it's happening where it's not a gendered issue, right, then that's different because they're telling everybody, quiet, hush, we're in a masjid. But if it's like your girls are being isolated, like you, your girls, you should not do that, that's where I would say, well, wait a second. You know, they're children, they're young, uh, first of all, and the gender factor doesn't matter. You know, that's uh, if you're going to teach someone to have decorum or, you know, um, proper behavior, don't gender it. Don't make it about a matter of that. Because in Islam, those rules are for all of us. When we look at adab and we're looking at all of these, you know, ways of being, they there. It's for men and women, boys and girls. You know, it's not about or of this group gets special rules and this group can do whatever they want. That's entirely cultural, and those double standards are so toxic, and that's what uh, pushes a lot of people out of the masjid. It's why people are unmasked, because they don't feel welcome coming to the masjid. They don't feel like there's a space for them. But this is the house of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why, as a mother, 
uh, you know, if, if you're observing that, I would say go right to the leadership and say, we need to change the way we frame these things because I don't want to, to come across like my girls are the, or the girls are the only ones who should be talked to this way, you know. If we have rules, make it for everybody, you know, and, and yeah, push back on that. But thank you for bringing that up because I think it's, it's a very, um, uh, you know, it's, it's there, but it's like we, we sometimes don't talk about these things, so it's like hard to address them. But when you mention these, I'm sure everybody's minds kind of, you know, we're all like thinking about experiences that we've had, and now it's something, right? And maybe we'll be more aware of it next time. Maybe we can step in, you know, if we see something that we think is being uh, unfair, where it does, you know, impose something that, again, is not from our religion. Modesty is about having, you know, just a proper, you know, boundary, you know, knowing boundaries um, and really being able to protect yourself uh, from harm. You know, it's, it's a lot of it has to do with preventative, uh, you know, measures for yourself and for other people, but it's, a, it's about boundaries and just creating that, um, you know, having that kind of understanding, but it's boundaries for everybody, not just a girl's issue or a woman's issue. Yes. Absolutely. And I just actually wrote something the other day. I posted it, but I wanted to tweak it, so I took it off. But I actually wrote the whole thing, and it was, the whole thing was about this topic, that modesty is not just for girls. Because this message is very, it's actually hurting our boys. Our boys need to be reminded that modesty is a part of being a Muslim. And so if we turn a blind eye to Ma you know, toxic masculinity, which is everywhere, and the culture that it's breeding, even in young boys, where boys are perfectly comfortable walking around without their shirts, and they're just showing all this machismo and bravado, and they're talking a certain way, or they engage in, like, really inappropriate jokes and banter that is totally void of all modesty, and we think, oh, it's okay, but it's boy culture, locker room talk, boys bantering, boys will be boys, let them be. But then we do the opposite, where the second our girls say anything or show like a little bit of something, <gasps> you know, we shame her and make her, it's like, what are you doing? That is the most distorted and horrible message because you're empowering one to do things that are actually detrimental to the spiritual uh, health. Boys should be totally modest. They should not feel, you know, open to, to showing their bodies the same way a girl does. Why? Why should a boy feel totally comfortable with that? You know, alhamdulillah, like I have two boys and um, they were recently at a sports event and, you know, someone mentioned that all the boys were taking off their shirts and my eldest son was like refusing. He's like, no way. I refuse to do that. And all the boys were totally confused. Like, what's the big deal? You know, we're out. It's hot. But he just hits part of his fitra right now. He's only 11. And I was like, I'm so proud of him that he didn't give in, that he didn't give in to the peer pressure and feel the need to show off and show himself, that he maintained his own modesty because he didn't feel comfortable. And that's, alhamdulillah, something that we, we've inculcated from the, uh, as young children. You know, we, I don't think parents, it's not cute to have your children walking around like, you know, in their underwear or, or with their clothes off, even toddlers. Why? Why is that cute? And you see some people, oh, it's no big deal. No, if you don't do that from a young age where you teach them that their bodies are beautiful, but they should protect them and they should protect, you know, to, to keep, you know what I mean? Keep that uh, for themselves. Then, God forbid, you know, other th it can lead to other things. It can lead to them, God forbid, either being taken advantage of or them just getting way too comfortable with, with that part of their being at an early age, which is exactly what's happening in the society. It's hypersexualized. Young children are being taught to see themselves as that way. And so that leads to early engagement and early promiscuity and early behaviors, illicit behaviors that we don't want any of our kids to be doing. But it's related because when modesty is taken out of the picture and it's just like, be free and, you know, if you, you know, have it flaunted and it's okay and it's hot. And it's like, no, you know, that's, you know, not, that's not from our, our faith. So I agree. Thank you for mentioning that it's a, for all men and women. I'm sorry, I saw some hands. Yes. Okay, so the two older ones are. Okay, so... Um, this is a you know pretty big topic, and we address this a lot in our parenting sessions uh, because a lot of parents are struggling with the same thing. So I want to put that out there. You're not the only one. 
a lot of parents are having. And it's it's a new world, you know. We have to, our generation, you know, internet kind of started with us, but what it's become is so different, especially when you consider the immense pressures that teenagers are under already, even without social media. They already have so much internal pressure that they, you know, from themselves, but also in their peer groups to, uh, you know, to, to fit in. And so then you add social media, it's a whole other layer. And there's a lot of, I mean, I don't know if you, how often you talk to teens, but if you talk to them, they'll kind of give you an idea of like the politics or the, you know, the, the rules of engagement for teens on social media. It's different than adults. Like it's, it's, it's much more complicated. Like you have to be very careful that you don't come across too desperate, but then at the same time, <laughs> you have to reciprocate. So yeah, if you're going to post a picture, post a picture of yourself in a modest attire, but then a friend, even if it's from an opposite gender, is liking your pictures, it's kind of like social currency. You got to trade back and forth with likes, you know, and follows. And it's, it's a lot more pressure than I think adults uh, can appreciate. So we have to be understanding that if you, once you open that portal of social media for them, there are rules of engagement that they feel that they have to oblige by, but I think the conversations you have with them that constantly remind them to not give uh, give away their like to not compromise their principles is really important. Because when I talk to teens, I that's my focus. Do not compromise yourself. Do not put yourself out there um, in a in, in in a position that can eventually harm you. Um, because the digital footprint is real and people are sometimes not aware of that because teens have a problem, first of all, with self-regulation because, you know, their prefrontal cortex isn't fully developed and so they really can be very impetuous and, and, and they, they get excited, they're excitable. So something happens in the moment, they snap it, boom, or they send a picture, boom, but they don't realize like that has a lasting footprint that could actually really come back to harm you maybe five, two, three, one year down the line, you don't want to do that. So when you're you know, using social media, be incredibly responsible with it. And actually, you know, before you post anything, go back, maybe you can write like sort of like a checklist for them where you have specific questions that they have to answer before they hit send, you know, which is, is it gonna make a lot angry, first of all, you know, whatever I, it is I'm posting. Is it going to make mom and dad upset? Could this somehow affect my, you know, reputation moving forward, you know, down the line? But kind of have like a little brief checklist and then say, that's your internal checklist. And if you think it's green light, go. I trust you and I trust your judgment. But remember, you know, that this is what I'm protecting you from. And I think as long as you have those constant check-ins, you're okay because, Remember again, it's so hard once they've they're in that world. It's hard to, and that's why I mean, I personally, I, I always tell parents, try to delay it as often as possible. I mean, 16, 17 is still good. I see some parents, 11, 12 year olds, they're on social media, and you know, I was, it's sad, but you know, I I um I do have extended family members and people that are on you know that are connected with me on Instagram, and you can see you know on the Explorer page what people are liking. And I've, uh, I, I stumbled on uh, someone's page the other day and I was just shocked because I can see, even if you don't do that, if you go to a certain person's page, let's say a celebrity, the top likes, they'll tell you, you know, who they are if they're connected to you, you know? So like, let's say um, <clears throat> someone like Kylie Jenner, you know, she's got almost what, two million maybe followers on Instagram. If you go to Kylie Jenner's page, Whatever post she has, if one of the people that are connected to you likes them, you'll see it. You don't, it's not like you have to actively go look for it, right? So I remember, um, you know, just recently I did that, and I saw very young girls liking incredibly provocative images that she had posted. And I was shocked. I was like, oh, no, she's, like, way too young to like that image. That image is horrible. It's very, like, you know, over. So we kind of have to, you know, talk to our, our youth about, you know, engagement and like, you know, you shouldn't be observing certain things. You shouldn't certainly be 
uh, endorsing certain things. And a like is an endorsement, whether you like it or not. You know, if you're if your friends are going out and they're getting drunk and playing beer bong and you're liking it because you think it's a funny picture, you are endorsing that lifestyle. So make a you know have that discernment. You know what I mean? And those are the conversations I think you have to have to help them see like. Even though you think you're being a good friend by just, it's not a big deal, it's just a picture. What you're saying is that I, you know, I approve of that lifestyle. And that's totally, you know, antithetical to your, your faith, your belief system. So don't do that, you know. But giving them, I think, guidelines on how they engage is really important. And not just saying, oh, I'm just going to try to be your friend and, and let, you know, step back. That's a mistake. Don't do that as parents. You should be overseeing what they're doing once they're on social media and uh, and giving them guidelines constantly, you know, inshallah. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you. Because all the other stuff is yes has to do with their, you know, relationships with that. But most importantly, is is absolutely the spiritual impact, right? Because yes, being desensitized to things is also a chronic uh, problem that we have in the world. We've all we're all afflicted by desensitization. We've all been desensitized to sin, to like the worst social ills around us because we've seen it so much. So exposing your eye to things will lead you down that path. And that's why when they're engaging on social media, they should be very select. They should have, you know, they should be very specific about what they're going to do and what not, they're not going to do. And, um, you know, just giving them those guidelines and that type of nasiha, I think, should hopefully help, inshallah. Yes. First of all, I have to ask, are your parents in the room? Are they? Excellent job, Father. This is a very articulate and smart young man. MashaAllah. May Allah bless you. What grade are you in? 11th. Very, I, I haven't met an 11th grader that had that much, right? MashaAllah. Just eloquence and ability to, you know, really uh, put out such a great uh, question. Thank you so much for that. Very thoughtful. Um, you know, you're speaking to a homeschooler, so I don't know if you want to hear my answer. Um, but with with respect, with respect, I have nieces and nephews that are in public school. I have many friends that put their kids in public school. I really think a lot of it has to do with the parenting. And clearly, mashallah, your uh, parents have uh, filled you with a sense of uh, identity and pride in who you are and that strength that sees this as a challenge. I don't know if all, you know, students have that, you know, same, you know, like ability to do that because maybe their environment is different. So if you're asking me generally speaking, I mean, I, I do believe, and I'm just being honest, I think that uh, public schools have gotten to a point where they're very toxic, not just for Muslim kids, I think for all children. And this is why we're seeing a huge increase in so many different mental health issues and you know a lot of problems that are, high schoolers are experiencing. And I know I have friends who are social workers. They work on campus, and they meet with regularly uh, children who are struggling with drugs, with so, uh, you know uh, suicidal ideation, with a lot of you know anxiety disorders. And it's very common. It's not like it's just a certain group of kids. You know, when I was in school, there were groups that we thought like, oh, okay, those are those kids. You know, they're caught up in all the bad stuff. But now everybody's doing it, and it's across, uh, you know, all demographics or all uh, socioeconomic backgrounds. You have some of, uh, you know, for according to the research I've read and heard, some of the most affluent areas are actually the worst, where you have rampant drug abuse, a lot of promiscuity. So it's like, where's the safe haven anymore, right? And I feel like our schools are really turning into just really, really toxic places for children. So I'm not a fan, generally speaking, but again, when I feel like a family is on it and they their children have are supplemented with other things that can protect them from a lot of these things, they manage. Because I've met several students like yourself, mashallah, who don't seem like they're phased uh, or and actually they can, they're likely doing, you know, good work where they're actually pushing back and trying to be a force of, good for, for the students around them, you know? So so I think it just it depends on every family needs to make that decision for themselves. But I do think that we are seeing a trend more and more 
families, not just Muslim, are, are moving away from the public school model and looking into alternative schooling. That includes homeschooling, that includes private schools, that includes uh, co-ops and, and really creating, you know, a lot of people, for example, in tech. It's a known fact. Some of the most wealthiest um, and successful people in tech do not send their children to conventional school programs. They actually look for and or create uh, alternative schools that are very much similar to a more, you know, um, tailored but uh, homeschooling sort of model where it's, you know, looking at the individual student's uh, needs and, and, and helping, uh, you know, cultivate in healthy environments where they're not having to deal with a lot of the social pressures. So I think, you know, to answer your question, um, yeah, it, it depends on the individual family, but generally speaking, I do feel like we as a community, because we're seeing not only social you know, problems affecting the youth, but also faith crises. This is the other problem because you know, there are, there's an agenda and we have to be very clear about that. There is an agenda to um, deconstruct people's concept of faith and religion uh, and to kind of uh, you know, just push them into a different direction. For example, how many of you have heard of Ayn Rand, right? So her uh, philosophies, she's a philosopher, uh, objectivism I think is what it's called, is very popular in academia and even in the high school level. Uh, the Ayn Found Foundation, uh, Foundation, excuse me, she, they send like hundreds and thousands of books for free every year to public schools across this country. And her entire philosophy is very anti-religion in every way. It's very much about just you do you, you know, it's all about self, the, the self, and really uh, there's no social, like, you know, like, you know, the, the, the like responsibility to, to, for the other. It's really much more about, you know, taking care of your own needs. But these philosophies are becoming so popular. I, I remember reading somewhere that her book was um, in the Library of Congress, second after the Bible, uh, uh, you know, in terms of popularity. In ter so it's, her philosophies are everywhere. And this is why you see a lot of people in high school, uh, but also at the college level, um, increasingly pushing back on, uh, you know, organized religion and and finding ways to, you know, get their message across, you know. You know what I mean? In 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 direct ways, in in the classroom environment. I remember I had a mom say that her daughter, she was a high schooler. She was very practicing, uh, almost at the point, I mean, she was doing her prayers, mashallah, and she was very close to wearing her hijab full time. She was wearing it part time. And then she took a course um, on philosophy and her instructor was a uh, total atheist and started, you know, pummeling all the students with all these questions and making them question and doubt, you know, all the faiths. Um, but on specific social issues. So what they do is they take social justice issues, right? And they'll start making, you know, innocent children start questioning their faith. So that caused her a big conflict because uh, one of the issues, which is actually a big social justice issue now, or it has been for a while, but it's very popular, um, you know, to, to talk about. And it's a, it does cause a lot of youth, Muslim youth conflict is the LGBTQ rights issues, right? Uh, this is a big, you know, I have, I meet, I've met with several families where their teens are struggling with faith because they don't know how to reconcile that part of Islam. You know, they have friends who are gay or they, you know, from high, from kindergarten or whatever, and they just don't know how to navigate that. So what they're left with is a crisis in faith, and then next thing you know, you know, they're doubting. Just recently, I had someone, uh, you know, call me with that very concern. So it's common, but this is what, unfortunately, being in an environment where where you're, you know, being conditioned to 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 think a certain way, um, on the notion that you're being deconditioned. That's what that's what's kind of interesting is that they're they sell it like they're helping you free your mind from the confines of, you know, being indoctrinated by organized religion, but then they're just filling your mind with their own version of their organized religion, right? Which is basically hedonism and whatever you want to do, do it. So you have to kind of, you know, ask yourself as a parent, do you want to put your child in an environment like that? You know, where, where they're going to be 
susceptible to all kinds of different messages. Um, and are they prepared for an environment like that? That's really the question. Someone like yourself, again, I don't know your background, but if you've been attending classes and you're, mashallah, learned and you've studied your deen and you kind of already have, alhamdulillah, a solid grounding of who you are, maybe you're the type of person that's like, I'm up for debate, let's talk, you know, and you challenge those ideas, right? And you're willing to, or you're able to defend your position, but I don't know if I've, if, I've, if everybody is in, in that position to do that. So that's why I think it's a very personal conflict. Yes, a lot of hands. Yeah. Which is so important. I'm so glad you mentioned that because one of the things is whether your kids go to Islamic school, private school, or even home school, it's very important that we as parents actively engage them with their community center or somehow find a supplement where they have another environment that actually does help them in their faith identity, right? And so, and the, and the research also shows that that the more you invite your children to participate with their local religious center the less likely they're gonna fall into the six major risk behaviors that teens fall into, right? Drug abuse, alcohol, promiscuity, all those things that we're worried about, smoking. All of those things get reduced the more they're engaged with their religious you know, organization. So it's very important to, to uh, offer that as a supplement because you know, if their 90% of their time is with students or in an environment that has no mention of Islam or even against Islam, possibly, um, and it's just really, you know, spiritually totally dry and there's nothing there, then how do we expect them to uh, bolster themselves and to fortify themselves to be able to tackle the serious issues that they're taking on if we're not giving them some supplement to, to, to all of that, right, to counter that? And so the way you can do that is to um, either bring them here or another option if, you, if it's hard for you logistically and I highly encourage parents to do this, is to create halaqa groups in your home for your children. Invite their friends, invite their parents, or you know whoever that you need to invite. But if you can't, if you don't have like um, a place to outsource, then take the reins and do it. It's once a month or once every other week or whatever is easy for you, even quarterly, is better than nothing. Because it provides a space and a time for them to be around kids that are like them and to learn, and I mean, I've, I've been to home halaqas where they do that. They'll have, you know, uh, an effort where all the parents will come together and it's like a one, maybe once a month thing or once every two, three month thing, but then they'll invite a speaker. They'll invite a popular speaker to come and say, you know, this is for you guys. We're doing this because we wanna provide a space for you to be with your peer groups, maybe kids you like, but you don't see enough because you go to different schools and everybody's over scheduled and you don't have enough time, but at least we can help you socialize in a good, halal, healthy way and learn at the same time from a speaker that's relevant who's gonna be able to speak to them on that level. It's interesting, it's not a boring speech that you force them to come to. Because sometimes parents think like, oh, I'm gonna bring in the Jummah khutbah and that's it. Well, if the Jummah khutbah is like way over their head and they're literally dying inside because they're like, why am I here, you know? This is the most boring thing ever, you know? And they are, you know, looking at their phones the entire time. Do not pat yourself on the back because you brought them to Jummah. That's not enough. You, you know, you might have actually made them never want to come back to the masjid because that was such an awful experience. So look for the speakers that your kids actually like. And I'm just going to do a plug now because uh, I trust uh, our, our dear teacher, um, Sister Hina Mukhtar, she posted the other day about a sheikh who's going to come here on, I think, the 25th, right? Sheikh Hamza Karamali, right? Is that his correct name? So he's coming on the 25th. If you have a teenager, you should come, by the way. Make a note in your calendar. But a teenage boy especially, um, he, they say he's fantastic with boys. Like, he's really good with youth. Not just boys, I'm sure girls can attend too. But he's really good with youth. And he talks about all these hot topic issues in a relevant way where the youth feel like, okay, this guy gets us. That's the kind of speaker you want to be looking for for your children because, you know, we have, mashallah, of diverse, you know, uh, um, you know, healthy, robust, you know, speakers lists that of, of people all over the country that come and go, you know, through through our masajids and our institutions. 
but that doesn't mean that every single person is going to match, you know, just like, so you want to look to which speaker do your, do your kids like, and then see uh, about their programming and see if you can bring them to those events, you know, but make it an active thing where you do ahead of time. Don't, and, and one thing I'll just say this, and no teenager has ever asked me to say this, but I feel like parents also need to be respectful of, of, of teen schedules and their lives. I really think it's wrong to impose what you want on your children just because they're your kids and you just do what I say. Your kids will respect you much more if you go to them and say, listen, you know, I know you've got finals and papers to write and a lot of things going on. You might have plans with your friends, but guess what? I would like to spend some time with you too. So can we mark uh, a date in the calendar and you let me know what day works for you? This is a really nice healthy, respectful exchange that shows your teens that you respect their schedules. Because I think the worst thing to do is to drag your teen by, you know, just totally, they don't want to be here, but you're dragging them because you think it's good for them. Uh, you're going to build resentment in their heart. They're not going to want to be here. It's just not healthy to do that. So don't do that. Okay. Have a plan ahead. Make it a priority, inshallah. This is, a, you know, alhamdulillah, really insightful. Are there other, are there, I had other hands. Yes, you and then you yourself. Go ahead, please, this one. No, it's a great point, Marshall, and I agree 100%. Keeping your kids active in extracurricular activities, things that are going to benefit them, life skills, uh, sports, all of those things is really valuable and important. It's great for confidence building. It's great for, it'll, it'll you know, the, the benefits they'll reap for, for decades if they do that. And it protects them, like you said, from boredom, which is what usually people do when they're bored is they resort to, yeah, you know, wasting time browsing, watching YouTube videos for hours on end or binging Netflix or whatever people do. It's because they're not doing something more productive. So I agree with that. And for youth, um, that is a, a way of, of, you know, avoiding a lot of those problems. Uh, so thank you for that. And hopefully any parents who might not have thought about those things, uh, maybe that can be a priority, you know, about how can I you know, look at, and especially if you're in a, like the city of Pleasanton, I know all the cities have them, they have their calendars up, you know, on online, they have year round classes that they offer that are not necessarily connected to a school, but still are uh, sometimes even funner. They have, you know, fun options that they do try to make available for parents and youth, um, their after school hours, so to accommodate for, for school. Uh, but I would say look into those city classes and see, and they're affordable, they're not, you know, terribly, uh, you know, you're not breaking the bank taking them. Yes? Uh, it is updating, so inshallah, check that out. But inshallah, next, so for next week, just because we're, we're almost out of time here, for next week, I'm um, sorry, looking at the new book here, I'd like you to please go uh, for, uh, look into the first three um, diseases here. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to try, um, actually go to four. We're going to try, be ambitious. The previous uh, session I did, we only had about an hour and 15 minutes per class. We have more time here, so we can actually give more time to each one. But, so maybe we could do four. So we'll do miserliness, right, all the way through to, what is it, envy? No. Uh, is it love of the world? Is that correct? Oh, wait. I should just go. You know, I, I'm flipping through. Why don't I just go to the first, <laughs> the contents? So, yeah. Go to miserliness, wantonness, hatred, and iniquity. So we'll go through those four for next week. So if you can read from page 10 to 20, inshallah, and finish the rest of the introduction. The introduction's got a lot of great insights. Uh, we didn't get through all of it, but uh, read that on your own all the way up until then, and then we're going to go through each disease, inshallah, and we'll, we'll talk in depth, okay? And if you have any questions about each disease, please come prepared, because this is exactly the kind of discussion I really appreciate that you guys were so actively participating. That's awesome. That's the kind of classes I like to have. So bring your questions, inshallah, and uh, we'll see you next week. We'll end in dua, inshallah. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika shadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayka. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala sayyidina wa maulana habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sallam taslima kathiran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa la asr illa man sana wa fil khusr illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihati wa qimu salat. Jazakallah khairan. Yeah.